Hello. I am Robert Blum from Phoenix Software. I am a uh, senior developer at the company. I work on Windows, uh, legacy products, uh, some web development, um, and Zoe at this point. I also use the mainframe. Not your typical open source person. This is a 20 minute presentation. The conference makes this presentation available for download. If my, if you look in your, on the schedule for this particular uh, presentation, you will find that you can download all these slides. I'm going to be basically summarizing the slides. It is a how to, and you will probably want to get those slides to do the same work. My talk matches the slides, as I said. I use these slides, use these slides as a reference and how to. I provide handy tables of actions you'll take, which I will summarize and speak to. Don't sweat the details. Take notes only for questions and important concepts. I'll provide my email for follow-up questions, errata, updated URLs, and any revised slide deck. The GitHub repository hosts the Finnish Zoe app, so you can take a look at it. You could leave now, but where's the fun in that? Why not stay and see how I did it? These are instructions for version 2 with annotations for version 1 that require only that you have the Zoe desktop up and running and the authority to make changes. You may need to be granted the proper security levels to the host. Um, that happened a lot of times. You will need an acceptable editor like VS Code or Eclipse. You should have development experience with HTML and JavaScript to manage your web app and to modify the example. Zoe is a big project with big ideals. I think we know that. The goal is to make mainframe resources more accessible to users not trained to use the mainframe. And here are some of the projects. What we are doing here is bucking the Zoe learning curve. There is an expectation of familiarity with open source and Linux. Little Zoe tutorial material is available. And the documentation reflects the, the bigness of Zoe. It is concise material, reference material, that is short on context, how to, and why necessary written by and for those who already know how to do what is documented, providing, exam, providing samples without explanation how to install or manage them. That's what I'm doing today. My CTO told me, put EJES Web on the Zoe desktop. Such a directive may be why you are sitting and listening to this today. This is the one time I will show my company's application. EJS Web is a web application which are, with a rich and fluid UI, communicates with the host using a REST API. It leverages JavaScript and jQuery in the client with a backend of Java, CNN, C++, JNN, and Optini optimized assembler. It's been GA since 2013. We didn't really want to invent, reinvent the wheel. Neither did we need to. We're busy and have a dozen other projects just like everybody else here. On the left, you'll see EJS Web running in a browser. On the right, it's a Zoe plugin. Something simpler maybe you'd want to do? Well, here's just a, here's a day of year web app, simple. And it's also running as a plugin under Zoe. The Zoe app called a plugin is installed in Zoe. 
okay? The web app uses code identical to the plugin. Both of those sides that you saw are running the same code. It leverages the Zoe iframe app framework. There are two ways to use the framework. The first is to store your web app in the Zoe directory structure, basically cloning your main files. You only add statements. The second way is to add statements to index.html stored in the Zoe directory structure, inserting an iframe tag with a URL to a hosted web app. That's what EJS Web is doing. Why demystifying? The process of creating an iframe app framework plugin is relatively easy for a web developer. Figuring out what I needed to do and how to do it without beginner documentation proved, well, challenging. I am neither a fluent Linux user nor an open source devotee. All new stuff for me. You get the benefit from what I learned from weeks and weeks of trial and error. Here's some Linux tips, hard learned. You can read the slide yourself. The first important thing for you to do with version two of Zoe is to find your zoe.yaml file. This is your configuration file. Best way to do that, as far as I'm concerned, is to browse the job ZWES, LSTC, or find the proc. And if it's the job, you look for the 23i message that provides you the path to the configuration file. Or if you find the proc, you can find the config equals statement. That'll give you the path. Note that information down. There are other important directories that you're going to need. Here's a list of them. They are in the zoe.yaml file that you just found. Um, for, the, for the installation that we're going to do here, you only need the runtime directory and the workspace directory. You're also going to need to find the zoe command root, what I call that. This is where the zoe command is located in the runtime. Um, your runtime directory that we found previously, uh, you just add the uh, bin subdirectory and that's where it is. This is a table of the commands that you would issue. I'll talk more about that later. All I want to point out here is I found it easier to send a sig term to the running job, to the primary process, to bring down the Zoe desktop it's just cleaner. Um, for users of Zoe version 1, <clears throat> here is what the, the uh, directories look like under that. Uh, you'll look for the instance equals parameter in the ZWES VSTC job. Uh, you need to know where the scripts for installing are. That's the then subdirectory off the instance directory. Here's a table of the uh, important shell scripts that you're interested in. Once again, I found it was easier to send a signal, in this case, SIGHUP to the primary to the primary process in the desktop job came down cleaner. The Zoe desktop is a web app. Keep that in mind when you're working in this project. It behaves like a presentation manager like X Windows or the Mac GUI. It runs on various hosts like Windows and Mac. It, display, it, it is displayed in any compliant browser on any platform that will run that browser. Your web app simply becomes additional JavaScript runs alongside the Zoe desktop web app and obeys all the same rules. Your web app runs in a iframe. This protects Zoe from being hacked. Your app must obey all iframe restrictions. Programming it 
takes the same skill set as for programming web apps. You're modifying HTML, CSS, JavaScript. The code must be stored in a directory that Zoe can access. When you change your web app to make improvements to it, just like any other web app, just refresh your Zoe desktop. You may have to log in again. The browser will reload your code. When you change the metadata, you are changing Zoe files, not your web app. That's the manifest.yaml and the plugin definition.json file. To be able to do these updates, you will need to cycle the desktop app on all versions of Zoe. That's stopping and starting it, of course. This takes time, so you don't want to have to do it often. When you're debugging a Zoe plugin, it's just like debugging any other web app. The only big difference here is when you're looking for your code, you're going to have to open Webpack folders. It's usually the one at the bottom. You will find it, and then you can set breakpoints and do whatever you need. What's the iframe app framework app? It's a Zoe plugin. Your code is isolated in an HTML iframe tag. Think, uh, think CNN in a window. The frame resizes when the Zoe window resizes. Zoe provides services via the Zoe Zlux JavaScript object you can optionally use. You don't have to use it. It's optional. This gets you the ability to have persistence data, cross-app communication, and additional UE elements like notifications. However, it is a restricted sandbox. Your web app can only directly reference DOM elements and data inside its iframe element. It's an important thing you may not realize. Communication with Zoe requires post message. You can start from scratch with the Zoe iframe sample, sample app. That's kind of what I'm doing here. However, a completed GitHub repository, uh, I provide that at the end of this discussion. Much of this presentation also applies to my repositories. First thing you're going to do is install Git if you don't already have it. Then create a working directory. And that directory ought to be accessible to Zoe so that because Zoe is going to run that code. Then you clone the sample iframe app. And I, I provided a link for some tutorial information about that. You rename the folder create that was created by that cloning to my first app and CD to that folder. And then you can delete the Git directories because that's their versioning. You're starting your new project, so you might as well start clean. Uh, here are some files and directories you don't need. You can delete them if you like. Uh, these Git, Git files might prove useful. Take a look at them. Here are important project files and directories explained briefly. Um, what's important here is that all Linux for Z files must be tagged ISO 8859-1. That took me a while to realize. Uh, there is an exception. The icon file needs to be tagged binary. If you don't do this, it won't work. Um, a Zoe plugin is just a web app. Uh, the metadata uh, files uh, are special, and again, you're going to have to cycle uh, the Zoe desktop to get any changes you make to that. Here are some sample layouts you can look at so you understand what you're going to be building. Um, you may want to uh, make your own Git repository. Here's some instructions and example what that looks like. Now, about tagging. If you were like me, didn't even know that tagging existed, exists. 
Zoe is not EBCDIC, but you're on Linux for Z. So you need to do the tagging. Here's the commands that you would use and how to check the result that you actually tagged. I use Visual Studio Code for my work with the Zoe Explorer plugin installed. It allows me to edit both Windows and USS files. Eclipse or other editors are fine, as long as you can update the files and retain the 8859-1 tag. Extremely important. You'll go crazy if you don't keep track of these things. Um, the Zoe Desktop Editor under version 2 may work for you, so you might want to take a look at that. Uh, you will need an editor to update the icon file. Uh, MS Paint is good enough for that. You are going to have to maintain that binary tag, of course. Um, you will need to change some properties in the plugin definition.json file. Here's a table of what you need to change, and some of these are optional. You're going to have to make some edits to the files that you received. Here's a table of things that are uh, mandatory, and some of them you may find are optional. So we're going to install now. So the, you're going to need to find three directories. You're going to have to find the root of the Zoe command uh, directory. That's the runtime directory we identified earlier, subdirectory bin. You're going to have to find the path to your zoe.yaml file. That's config here. And plugin, which is your directory for your app, the root of your app. So you'll cd to that root for the Zoe command, and you'll issue the install command, which follows this syntax exactly. Uh, and I've shown a successful install here, so you can see what it looks like ahead of time. The result is you update the zoe.yaml file with some metadata so Zoe understands what your app looks like. You're also going to create a symbolic link. This is Zoe 2.0, by the way. Um, the symbolic link is part of the glue, so Zoe knows what it's going to do. And you will create a JSON file that points Zoe at your code. This is actually created for both uh, versions 1 and 2 of Zoe. You, if you are uninstalling under version 2 of Zoe, you will need to delete this file. There is no uninstall command as of version 2.2. Uh, the install step under version 1 is a little bit different, arguably easier. Um, again, you need to know where your plugin is, and you need to know where your instance directory is. Um, this is how to find it. Um, you will cd to the instance directory, subdirectory bin, and then issue this install uh, install dash app dot shell command. Mind the syntax. The dot slash for you non Linux users is a very important prefix here. It creates that JSON glue file I talked about. And here is an example of a successful install. Data services is an issue for version 2. Uh, it's an additional consideration since I'm maintaining that connection in the sample app that we get from Zoe. Under version 1, it is pre-installed. You don't have to do anything. And version 2 is delivered with the runtime, but not pre-installed. So you have to do one of two things. Either you have to install it, and here is the command syntax for doing it, or you can delete that property from, you can delete the data services property from the plugin definition.json file. This took me days. It's an important thing to know. Okay, and for all versions, there's a final install step. You have to, re you have to restart the Zoe desktop app. We've set, all that we've done is basically set up what's necessary so that when Zoe starts up, it 
initializes your app. Um, you only need to only need to cycle Zoe when you initially install an app. When you uninstall an app and want to remove it from the desktop, and when you change the metadata. And if you followed all my instructions, there's my first app showing in the little start menu running under the Zoe desktop. Shown in the previous slide, when it comes up, you will find it in the start menu. Now your next steps are to modify the index.html file, to remove the sample UI and replace it with your web app. At minimum, you're going to add metadata to the script tag. You're going to replace or augment the body tag. If that's if you, all you want is your web app to appear on the Zoe desktop, that's really all that you're going to have to do. Okay, you you probably want to modify the icon, and if you decide to use the iframe CSS, you may want to modify that. But I'm guessing your web app already has CSS. So a little bit more detail. The script tags in the index.html file come with the Zlux, excuse me, Zoe Zlux object functionality pre-installed. It includes the Zoe official logger and API functions to access the Zoe UI, and those are found in the main.js. Use the JavaScript functions that are in the body of that file to exercise the Zoe Zlux features like notifications, persistence, inter-app communications, and that's your data services, actually. Uh, use the iframe loaded function, which is at the bottom, uh, to do necessary UI setup once your plugin has appeared on the Zoe desktop. This is when you measure your interface so you, your web app knows what it's dealing with and can resize automatically. It's very important. The body tag will contain your application's UI. Uh, here's examples of what a modified script tag will look like with the Zoe provided stuff at the top and things like jQuery and the JS for my day of the year web app, which is basically your web app. And, uh, and other CSS. And on the right is the modified uh, HTML that actually exercises my JS web app. An example, so you understand what it looks like. Now, if you're doing something like I did with uh, EJS Web, which is a hosted web app, um, you can insert web app from a server URL. Um, you are going to have to provide that URL to be available in the index.html. You can use Zoe Persistence if you want, or you can insert it into the web content property of the web, excuse me, plugin definition.json file, or you can hard code it into the index.html. You'll just need to be able to get to that server URL. You can change the tag values in the uh, index.html file so you can address it. And then you can add JavaScript that creates an iframe that fills the Zoe window. I do that dynamically. You could hard code this too if all you need to do is get it up and running. Here's an example of the code I used. So in review, your My First app is now running under Zoe. All you want is your web app to run and don't care about interacting with Zoe. You can copy your supporting files from your web app application. You can then modify the index.html to add metadata to the script tag to get your things like, like jQuery and your CSS. And replace the HTML at the bottom in the body tag. Or you can create an iframe to host your server app via URL. Mission accomplished. It really is fairly easy once you know how.
Uh, you could use my day of the year GitHub repository instead of using the uh, sample that's provided by Zoe. It contains an iterated iframe sample code with all the previous changes and more. And my little calculator might be useful. It uses the same install and tagging procedure just discussed and provides an updated index.html where I've replaced, where you can replace my JavaScript with yours in the final script tag and replace my HTML with your web app HTML in the body tag. Here is the links that you would want to look at. It also includes a readme that talks about installing the product, which is something that I found lacking in all the other samples. I get to do this because we did it in the keynote yesterday. Um, the eJazz Web iFrame App Framework Zoe plugin is open source. The back end isn't, of course, that's a proprietary. Running this plugin requires eJazz and its REST API. However, the code is still usable as a starting point for your application. This plugin uses post message to message between Zoe and the iframe code back and forth through an iframe. Uh, WebApp.js, which you'll find, is basically our web app with the proprietary code removed but the Zoe communication structure intact. The served up web app know, will then know that it's running under Zoe, behave differently if it's running under Zoe or it's running separately. It accesses persistence data in Zoe and includes a function to request the Zoe plugin to do work. So my web app I can type in a command, and boom, Zoe will do something for me. And it's using the post message, uh, using post message to do that. Again, if you take a look at the repository, you can figure out how I do that. Functions in main.js were modified to return data via callback functions instead of inserting data in HTML tags. I've also added console logs all over the place, so you can look at the JavaScript console and see how the magic occurs. This is in active development. I have a bunch of things I need to get out before GA at the end of this month. It's, I'm adding stuff, and we'll be continuing to add stuff. Just for reference, here is the web app.js that's doing the communication with Zoe and recognizing it's running under Zoe. I've included the current version in here, and I'm done. Any questions? Go ahead. Would you? Yeah, otherwise they won't understand. So here we go. No, thanks very much for that. That was really good. My first question is, you know that sample app you had, that web app? Not your eJazz one, but the little calculator. Yes, that's all in here. Let me show you. There you go. Because what the path that you've just gone through is phenomenal for us to sort of learn from yeah. and share that. I wonder maybe we could think about maybe bringing that app actually into a Zoe repository and creating I like a tutorial and blogs and really making that the reference case, if you're okay with that. I would, be, I would be willing to do that. I've basically done all the uh, footwork for that. Like I said, the readme.md for these basically are a summary of all the steps that are necessary to install the sample app so that somebody who is a Windows programmer or a mainframe programmer that can hack this mostly 
can now look at this reference and do it. No, it's perfect. You're like, I know I'm not a rock climber, I know Jacob is. You're like one of those climbers that goes up first and has to leave, leave the pins in place and work out the path. So hopefully right. everybody else doesn't find it, um, the gradient quite as steep. That was awesome. Thanks. Really good job. Thank Rose. you. Rose. I second it, Robert. Great, great session. Thank so you. I just, as, as you went on and I heard um, some feedback around the documentation, Yes. As well as um, um, possibly, and, and maybe maybe I just made an assumption here, when you had mentioned something like it took you weeks and weeks in trial and error to overcome some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, first of all, were you aware of some of the um, sort of tutorials that we put together for V2 in, in the office hours that we conducted? No. Uh, no. No, there's... It, the reference material for Zoe is extremely thorough, but as I've pointed out, it seems to be written by people that already know yeah. and don't want to forget. And the areas that you, you can think of me, well, maybe as a model user, somebody that doesn't know anything, mm -hmm. right? And I Google it, I get the reference material, I get the sample app, but it doesn't tell me where this good stuff is. And that's the, the, the problem. I've been in discussions with various people uh, through Slack mm -hmm. that have helped me. Thank God. Yeah. I mean, uh, he, he's helped me and a bunch of different people. Probably Sean. Helped me yeah. and, and said, oh, look at this. Yeah. And uh, I mean, little things like until recently that have been a difficulty for us. When Eric my support staff, my IT, went to install version 2. He goes to find something about migrating and says, coming soon. You've just fixed it, because I think I talked about it on Slack, but that was, these things are very difficult. Yeah. And I realize we have a lot of, in, in this project, not enough people doing the work. Mm -hmm. So it's understandable. But... Uh, Definitely for those people listening, get on Slack, find the Zoe channels. People are extremely willing to help you. I found that. And I've made suggestions to people who have talked about the documentation to make sure that there's links anywhere that people might come in to explain things like jargon, like what's a component? Well, it's a plugin yeah. from version one. That changed, and I could not understand what the documentation. I'm yeah. one of these people that uh, I can't remember the term that was in the keyword in the in the keynote. A divergent thinker. Yes. I'm dyslexic. Neurodivergent. Yeah, I'm on the spectrum. <laughs> Things like that. Yeah. But I'm a mainframe programmer. I'm a Windows programmer. You know. Yeah, we're super glad you to have you. Me. We're so glad that you did this. One more question for you. Are you planning to apply for conformance for your your plugin and have yeah, you I'm a little bit in? I'm a little bit late on that. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of changes on CLI, and by getting this done, I haven't done that. But yeah, the intention is to is to make it conformant because that's the direction of it. And the conformance would be applying for the EJS web. Mm -hmm. Right, because we, we want to to continue doing it. Excellent, that. excellent. We'll look for you out there in the, the landscape. Super, thank you. You're welcome. And any more questions going once, going twice? Well, thank you. I'm Robert Blum from Phoenix Software. Uh, my contact information is in the... Uh, in the presentation, uh, the PDF is downloadable from the schedule. Please go ahead and do that. Thank you.